Good morning everyone and welcome to our service for Sunday the 6th of June. It's the first Sunday after Trinity. Today we're beginning a new series of readings and sermons based on the second epistle to the Corinthians. The theme running through that book is God's power shown in human weakness. We remember the words of Jesus to the Apostle Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. As well as thinking on those things, of course, we bring our prayers and our praises to God today. So let's begin with a hymn. The Gospel calls us to turn away from sin and to be faithful to God. As we offer ourselves to him in penitence and faith, we renew our confidence in his trust and mercy. O God, our loving Father in heaven, we confess that we have sinned against you. We have broken your commandments. We have often been selfish and we have not loved you as we should. For these and all our sins, forgive us, we pray, through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. God is faithful and forgiving. Through the cross of Christ, he has mercy on us. He pardons us and sets us free. Know that your sins are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Please join with me as we say together the canticle Venite, which is Psalm 95. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God 
and a great king above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is from Deuteronomy chapter 5, a portion of the Ten Commandments which reminds us about keeping the Sabbath day. From Deuteronomy 5 verses 12 to 15. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labour and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, my. 
for our New Testament reading today. We begin a series of readings from Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians. And we're going to be hearing from 2 Corinthians over the next few weeks. But we don't begin at the very beginning. We begin in chapter 4. And so today's reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 to 12. Paul writes, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the mind of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our readings and sermons over the next few weeks are going to be based on St Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians, in which we see that Paul's feelings towards the Corinthian Christians are much the same as any parent might feel towards their children. On the one hand, he had the deepest love and affection for them, but on the other hand, to be honest, sometimes they just drove him nuts by their actions and by their attitudes. Paul first arrived in Corinth as part of his second missionary journey sometime between the years 50 and 52 AD and he found a bustling city, a real melting pot of Roman and Greek and Jewish cultures and a thriving centre of trade and commerce. It was an ideal place to establish a church. And so St Paul spent about 18 months doing just that, establishing a church in Corinth. And once the church was established, he then moved on to continue his missionary work elsewhere. However, it would seem that shortly after his departure, Paul received word that things were not going too well back in Corinth, in the new church there. So he wrote them a short letter to address some of the issues. And when that first letter didn't do the trick, he wrote them a longer letter, the letter that we now know as 1 Corinthians. No copies of that first short letter have survived. We only know about it because Paul refers to it in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9. But the longer letter, 1 Corinthians, in that letter Paul addresses some of the problems. There were divisions and disputes within the church. He addresses the issues of idolatry and immorality 
and loose moral standards. Unkindness towards the poorer or less gifted members of the church. And he points out that they were in error on some points of doctrine. Now you would have thought when Paul wrote to put them right on those things that that would have resolved the problems. But it appears that six months down the line, the Corinthian church was still in such a mess that Paul had to drop all his other work and go back to Corinth. He made what he later referred to as a, a painful visit in which there was presumably some difficult straight talking that needed to be done. And then he left there but still unsure as to whether things were getting back on the right track. His painful visit was then followed up by a, a sorrowful letter. Both of those are referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And it does seem that at least they had some positive effect. Because by the time Paul writes the letter that we know as 2 Corinthians, some months later, there were signs of improvement. But there was still some way to go. It's one of those strange things. It may seem a little confusing that the letters that we know as 1st and 2nd Corinthians were more likely Paul's 2nd and 4th letters to the Christians of Corinth. No copies of the other two letters have survived, nor do we have any further details about that painful visit. It's a bit like when a piece is missing from your jigsaw. That missing piece may be lost and gone forever, but you may still have an idea of its shape and where it should go because of the other pieces around it. As we'll discover in the weeks ahead, 2 Corinthians is actually a very personal letter. It's a bit of an emotional roller coaster, really. It reveals Paul's deep pain and hurt about what has happened in Corinth and the attitude of the Christians there towards him. Paul feels that some of the Christians in Corinth have turned against him, that they're withholding their affection from him. He's also acutely aware of his own weaknesses and imperfections. But he's writing to them to assure them of his love and affection for them. And if he has had to speak to them sternly about some of the issues within the church, it's purely out of a desire to glorify God and to see them walking faithful and true in the light of the gospel. At the same time, Paul expresses that he's overjoyed that they have accepted the gospel. And the letter ends on a, a positive and a confident note as Paul looks forward to visiting them again. So that's a, a broad overview. But there is one other matter underlying this letter that we need to be aware of. And it's the recent arrival in Corinth of the so-called super apostles. And that sounds like something out of a Marvel movie, doesn't it? It sounds like some sort of a superhero. We don't really know who they were or where they came from. Paul doesn't give us those bits of information. Although those reading his letter at first would have known that very well. But again, it's a bit like a missing piece in the jigsaw. Although Paul doesn't tell us about them directly, we can see their outline. We can catch their drift, as it were, by the things that Paul does mention or by the things that he implies indirectly. These super apostles seem to be a group of charismatic, dynamic, persuasive public speakers who have just recently arrived in Corinth. They have very strong Jewish credentials, which would have made them attractive to the Jewish Christians in Corinth. But they're also well trained in oratory, in the art of public speaking, which is appealing to Christians from a Greek background. And they proclaim a message 
that sounds very much like the gospel, but it's not the true gospel. Paul says that they're preaching a, a different gospel, a different Jesus. In fact, Paul goes further. He tells us that they're peddling the word of God for profit and that they're more concerned with self-promotion than with the true welfare of the Christians in Corinth. And yet the, the Corinthian Christians seem to hang on their every word and they don't have the discernment or the wisdom to recognise that they're being hoodwinked and led astray. Now, it seems that these super apostles, as Paul refers to them, were advocating a return to the Old Testament covenant of Moses and to Jewish rituals and traditions. So Paul argues in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that although the Old Testament covenant was glorious in its time, it was transitory, it was fading, and he says, it has now ended to be replaced by the New Testament, the new covenant in Christ Jesus. That new covenant is written not in letters on tablets of stone, Paul says, but it's written by God's spirit on the hearts of God's people. The new covenant is all about the glory of God revealed in the face and in the person of Jesus. That's the message that Paul has brought to Corinth and that's the message which the Corinthian Christians are in danger of now neglecting. But there is another slightly more insidious problem with these super apostles. They're proclaiming a message that's all about power and triumph and success. And superior religious experiences. And at first it sounds like a very attractive message. It even seems to be backed up in their own lives because they come across as being powerful and persuasive preachers, successful and superior themselves. But there's a problem. Their message just isn't true. The author Paul Barnett writes this, about that sort of preaching. He says, down the centuries, many Christians have eagerly listened to impressive sounding preachers who have raised their hopes that they too can enter heightened religious experiences. Those who embrace those hopes so much want them to be true that they feel unable to admit any problem or failing. Now we could add to that that you can still find that sort of preaching in some parts of the Christian church today. Preachers who hold out the false promise that those who believe in Christ will be made healthy, wealthy and wise. That all will be well for them. God will bless them with riches and success and power and status and superior religious experiences. You'll find it in some American tele-evangelists, that's probably the stereotype, but you'll also find it closer to home. It may sound like a, a very attractive message, it may even draw a crowd, but it's a false gospel. And sadly, many Christians don't have the biblical understanding or the discernment to recognise the difference. And then those who discover that those hollow promises are not matched in their daily experience of living, well, they can easily become disillusioned and fall away from the faith. In terms of his speaking ability, in terms of his preaching, the Apostle Paul didn't even come close to these super apostles. He's just not nearly as powerful or as persuasive. Compared to them, Paul probably seemed weak and unimpressive. And because of their influence in the church in Corinth, well, there arose a whole battery of accusations 
and complaints against Paul that he was abandoning the Christians in Corinth by going elsewhere, that he was using dishonest and deceitful means for his own purposes, that he had manipulated his followers and distorted or obscured the word of God. So Paul finds himself under pressure, boxed in and caught in a dilemma. On the one hand, you see, he wants to defend himself against those accusations to explain that he has set forth the gospel clearly and plainly to the Corinthians without deceit, without distortion. But on the other hand, he doesn't want to boast or to promote himself the way the super apostles do. Instead, Paul says he will boast only in what Christ has done. He will give the glory only to God. So Paul's message running throughout 2 Corinthians is to contradict this idea of the super apostles that Christian faith and Christian life is always met by power and success. His theme is that God's glory is revealed not so much in human power and success as the super apostles suggest, but rather in human weakness and frailty. We see it at the start of this epistle in chapter 1 verse 9 where Paul talks about being under unendurable pressure. He says so that we might rely on God and not on ourselves. And we meet it again towards the end of the epistle where Paul pleads with the Lord three times that his thorn in the flesh would be taken away. But the Lord simply replies to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And then, of course, in today's reading, in verse 7, where Paul says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all surpassing power is from God and not from us. Those who have Christ, according to Paul, have treasure, treasure beyond measure, you might say. But we hold that treasure in jars of clay, weak, imperfect, broken, human vessels. I heard recently that in Japan, if they have a piece of broken pottery, they do something different with it from what we might do. Here, we would probably get out the super glue and glue it back together. But we would do so in such a manner as to try to hide all the cracks, to make sure that the cracks could no longer be seen. But in Japan, they use a different method called kintsugi. They take gold dust and they mix it with the glue so that when they piece the pottery back together, the cracks actually become more visible. They're highlighted in gold. And it's the cracks, it's the brokenness that reveal the beauty. What we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is Paul under pressure, Paul beset by problems, and yet he can still say in verse 1, we do not lose heart. In fact, he can go even further than that in verses 8 and 9, the familiar words, we're hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Paul knows, and he wants us to know, that even in the midst of problems and pressures, Christ is present. God gives strength, and God's glory is revealed in human weakness. Last Monday morning, I went for a walk along the canal from Soldierstown Car Park down as far as Moira Station. 
and it was a beautiful morning, but even better than that, there was a brand new path. Maybe you've been along it yourself this week. It was lovely and clean, smooth tarmac the whole way. I even found myself as I was walking along, kicking the wee stones and the leaves off it just to keep that nice clean and clear look. But by the time I was walking back on the return journey, a dog had left big muddy footprints all along the path. It was spoilt. Well, not really. But you see, the path of life never remains clear and smooth and clean for very long, does it? Actually, the, the path of life isn't meant to be smooth and clear, nor is there any guarantee that it will lead to health and wealth and success. That message is a false gospel. God doesn't promise us a pain-free, problem-free, trouble-free life. But he does promise that those who trust in Christ will receive strength to endure and grace sufficient for the need so that we, we need not lose heart, as Paul says. You and I may well be little more than jars of clay. We're weak and fragile and we're easily broken. But Paul tells us that God's glory is revealed in weakness, in our brokenness, to show that the all-surpassing power comes from God and not from us. So may you and I so trust in Christ that like the Apostle Paul, we would know God's power and God's glory, even in those times of problems and pressure and brokenness. Amen.
Let us affirm our faith in God in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we pray as Christ our Lord commanded. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As we continue in an attitude of prayer, we first hear the words of the Collect for the first Sunday after Trinity. Let us pray. God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing without you, grant us the help of your grace that in the keeping of your commandments we may please you both in will and deed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a prayer for our church. Bless, O Lord our God, the worship and work of our parish church, that it may be a house of prayer, a centre of Christian teaching, a community of service, and a witness to your redeeming love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we think of the theme of human weakness today, we pray also for those who are suffering from any sort of illness or trouble. Lord God, the Father of all humankind, to whom alone is known the mystery of suffering. Hear our prayers on behalf of those who bear the burden of sickness or pain or any type of difficulty. In their weakness, Lord, and in their anxiety, draw near to them with your comfort and strength and give them the assurance that sharing their suffering, you will also share with them your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, a personal devotional prayer from St. Augustine that reflects on human weakness. Lord Jesus, our Saviour, let us come to you. Our hearts are cold, Lord, warm them with your selfless love. Our hearts are sinful, cleanse them with your precious blood. Our hearts are weak, strengthen them with your joyous spirit. Our hearts are empty, fill them with your divine presence. Lord Jesus, our hearts are yours. Possess them always and only for yourself. Amen. And the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. May God the Holy Trinity make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you with his truth and peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Hymn 578, 578, I Need Thee Every Hour. Spirit. 